Hi everyone, welcome back to Neurobiology at Providence College. I'm Joe DeGeorges. Today we're going to talk about a paper by Nordsted et al., which came out of Paul Greengard's lab. Uh, Greengard was a Nobel laureate, a uh, very close friend of mine, did her PhD with him. He passed away about a year ago. The title of the paper is The Identification of the Alzheimer's Amyloid Precursor Protein in Clathrin Coated Vesicles Purified from PC12 Cells. And before we get into the paper, I want to give you a little bit of an overview, which again is sort of the conclusion of some of these papers that we're going to talk about over the next couple of days, the rest of the week. So let me draw this out for you. We've talked about this before. So we all know that amyloid precursor protein contains a transmembrane domain based on our bioinformatic analysis and looking at it in a program like SMART. And so that means it's associated with membranes in some way. And it is, at least for part of its time, associated with vesicles. So this is a vesicle. And there's a very large portion of the APP molecule that resides inside the lumen of the vesicle. And then there's a transmembrane domain. And then there's a portion that sits, sticks out into the cytoplasm. So this is the C terminus of the protein, and this is the N terminus of the protein. Now, one thing I, I didn't mention earlier is that APP has a number of different RNA molecules that are generated from a single gene through alternative splicing. So we had talked about the fact that RNAs start out as an exact copy of one of the two DNA strands, and that exact copy is referred to as HNRNA for heteronuclear RNA, and then that molecule gets spliced such uh, that the introns are spliced out and the exons become part of the mature RNA molecule. So then you generate an RNA molecule which gets polyadenylated if it's a, in the case of messenger RNAs, and it gets capped at the five prime end. At any rate, there are actually two different RNA molecules and they generate two different size proteins. One is 695 amino acids long, and the other is 770 amino acids. And they mention those two uh, proteins in the paper, but they both contain the piece of the molecule that's pathogenic, the A beta fragment, which we've talked about. So if we go back to our diagram, this APP molecule gets cleaved in three different areas, or can be cleaved in three different areas. One is called beta, whoops, beta secretase. That is the name of the cleavage, beta secretase activity. And there is gamma, which happens within the transmembrane domain. And this forms the A-beta fragment that is pathogenic. And in the paper, they use a different nomenclature. They use beta A4, but that's the same as A-beta, or some people write out the beta. But at any rate, that's all the same small fragment that builds up in lesions of AD patients. And it's formed by beta and gamma secretase activity. There's also the possibility that the amyloid precursor protein gets cleaved within this site, within the A beta fragment, by alpha secretase. And again, that's the name of the activity, not necessarily the enzyme. There are many enzymes that are involved in these cleavage processes. And of course, it would be, it, 
or I should say that the when the beta fragment gets cleaved here, then it yields a non-pathogenic form. So there's two pathways, one that produces this A beta fragment and another cleavage pathway in which that fragment can be cleaved by alpha secretase. And if, some, if there's some way that we could drive all of the cleavage to the A beta pathway, I'm sorry, the, the alpha secretase pathway, then we could possibly alleviate Alzheimer's disease. So there's a big focus on these two metabolic pathways and what controls them. And there's also a lot of interest in where this proteolytic process actually happens. In this paper, the authors, the scientists, are looking at the endosomal lysosomal system, which is a really cool process for how cells break down materials. And so if we look inside a cell, I'm going to draw it like this. Of course, there's the lipid bilayer. And it turns out in the endosomal system, there's an endocytic process formed by clathrin coated vesicles, which we've already seen before in the Reese and Heuser papers on vesicle recycling. So this isn't the exact same process, but it's similar in that there's an endocytic event which retrieves membrane from the cell surface, from the cell membrane, and it gets pinched off and produces clathrin coated vesicles which in the Reese and Heuser papers looked like little T's were sticking out in cross section with electron microscopy. And then ultimately it pinches off and forms a mature endosome which has clathrin associated with it. So this is a clathrin coated vesicle. And ultimately, I don't want to get too deep into this process, but these clathrin coated vesicles form the endosomal system and they ultimately come together with another set of vesicles that are part of the lysosomal system. And when those come together, the contents is ultimately degraded. And the question is whether APP is associated in any way in this process particularly whether APP is associated with clathrin coated vesicles. That's what they're, that's what they're trying to look at in this particular paper. Okay, so what did they do? In the paper, they use a cell line called PC12 cells, which are cells that are easily cultured. The original culture were from cells of the rat adrenal medulla, which is a gland that secretes hormones. It's located on top of the kidneys. The cells are easy to grow and therefore it's easy to obtain a large quantity and they're also fairly easy to manipulate experimentally. So they say in the paper in the materials and methods section that they, they culture them in suspension, which of course means in liquid. So they had some sort of flask, or maybe it was a Petri dish, with the cells in the flask. And then over time, of course, they generated a very high number of these cells. And then they say that they collected them by just spinning them down. So now the cells are here in the pellet, and they can throw away the supernatant. And then they froze these cells until they were ready to use them. Once they were ready to go, they then, of course, this is biochemistry, so they made a PC12 cell milkshake with a little plunger device called a down homogenizer. So they've got cells here and they crush the cells with this little plunger. Then they say they spin it at low speed, so they generate a pellet in a supernatant, and they say that they take the supernatant 
and then they spin that supernatant at higher speed. And that generates a pellet and a soup. And they take the pellet and ultimately, after more centrifugation steps, they put it over something similar to the sucrose density gradients that we talked about for organelle isolation from squid giant axons, except instead of using sucrose, they used fancy stuff called FICOL. But at any rate, they were able to obtain a fraction that was highly purified clathrin-coated vesicles. And then they analyzed this sample by protein gels, by western blots, and by electron microscopy. They also used a second biochemical procedure that is called gel filtration, which separates things based on their size. So they have a little They have a long glass tube and they have a valve here so they can stop anything from coming out of the glass tube and they put in these beads that have holes in them, kind of like nooks and crannies. And the little stuff goes into the bead, beads and gets lost inside the holes for a little while and the large stuff goes around the beads because it can't fit in. And so this separates things based on their size and the big stuff comes off first and then the little stuff starts to come off later on. So they collect many tubes of this and in all of these procedures, whether it's this differential centrifugation process, whether it's FICOL density gradient fractionation or gel filtration, they save a little bit of the sample throughout the entire purification process so that they can analyze the sample and their results. Okay, so if you look at figure one of the paper, they first run a protein gel. And the gel has these wells. And the idea behind purification, obviously, is to start with a mixture of material and then try to take it through a series of processes that will enrich and ultimately purify whatever it is that you're trying to obtain, whether it's kinesin or the acetylcholine receptor or whatever. In this case, clathrin coated vesicles. So this first sample is going to be the entire mixture and it should be the least concentrated in clathrin-coated vesicles. And as you move towards a more pure sample, you should increase the concentration of clathrin-coated vesicles relative to everything else that's in the sample. And they run the gel, and of course that would produce a banding pattern based on the molecular weight of each protein that's in the sample. And you could just stain the gel that is, drop it into Kumasi blue and soak it there for a while and then rinse it off and you would see the proteins in the gel. But in this case, they transferred the gel to nitrocellulose, which you guys all know is just fancy paper. So they take their gel with the wells. They put it on top of a piece of paper, nitrocellulose, and after running the electricity in this direction to create the banding pattern. They run the electricity straight down through the gel and that transfers the banding pattern, the proteins that is, onto the piece of nitrocellulose. So in the end, you can throw away the gel and you're just left with the nitrocellulose with the banding pattern on the nitrocellulose itself. And then, you can stain the proteins on the piece of paper, on the nitrocellulose. And that's what they did. They used a substance called a stain called amido black, and they ended up getting a little faint band and then something that was a little stronger and a little stronger 
a little stronger and so on. And then it started to tail off a little bit. And this protein they knew was clathrin. You can also see some other proteins that are present inside the fractions. Of course, what they're trying to do in this study is purify clathrin-coated vesicles and determine what proteins are associated with them and whether amyloid precursor protein happens to be one of those molecules. You're out. Okay. Then they did a series of Western blots, and we all know that the Western blot is extremely similar to what we just outlined here, but instead of staining with amido black, they used antibodies that were raised either against different regions of amyloid precursor protein or against the transferrin receptor, which is a protein known to be associated with clathrin-coated vesicles. So that was a positive control and I want to go through each of those Western blots with you. This is still part of figure one. So below the amido black stained piece of nitrocellulose, which is the total protein, so you're looking at all of the proteins from each of the samples, they did a Western blot, and they only show you part of it. They don't show you the whole piece of paper. They just kind of cut out the section where the bands were to show you and they probed this with an antibody, they call it anti-APP C-terminus. Well, of course, the C-terminus is our old friend over here, which contains the highly conserved domain. Most likely, they made a recombinant version of this tail and injected it into a rabbit and made an antibody against that highly conserved C-terminal. And then uh, they ran another gel trans that's identical to what they've done over here with the total protein in amino black. They transferred it to nitrocellulose and then they incubated the nitrocellulose in the primary antibody, and then of course they used a secondary antibody, in this case which changes color. So the antibody would then bind to APP if it if APP is indeed sorry, hold on. If APP is on the piece of nitrocellulose, and again they're just showing you a piece where it actually did occur, then you would see a band of APP. And it turns out that they see a banding pattern very similar to what they see in clathrin. That is the most concentrated sample, that, that is it contains the most clathrin, also contains the most APP. And it turns out that you can also see, so this band is the 770 amino acid version of APP, but then you can see another faint band that also follows that pattern that is the 695 amino acid version of APP. So the point is, is that when you purify clathrin-coated vesicles, uh, you can determine where the highest concentration of the vesicles are based on the fraction that has the most clathrin. And in this case, the fraction that has the most clathrin also has the most amyloid precursor protein. Now they do also see, they give you another part of the gel, why they don't just give you the whole thing, I don't know, but they cut out another piece down here, 
and it turns out that that C terminal, these are both the C terminal antibody, also recognizes a very small molecule, but it follows the exact same banding pattern. And this is this fragment here, from here to here. That's what they believe, which is part of the molecule that's cleaved from gamma secretase. Okay, so let me try to redraw this, if I can. Okay, so now if we have our vesicle, the Western blots show that there are two forms, three forms, sorry, of APP. There's a very long form with the tail. This is the 770 version. Oh, 77. Then there's a slightly smaller version, which is 695. And then there's a short piece that has been cleaved. And in all three cases, the antibody recognizes this domain, this domain, and this domain. And that's what we have so far. Then it turns out that they do another Western blot, but this time they use an N-terminal antibody rather than a C-terminal antibody. And an N-terminal, which recognizes, oops, I think I did something to my pen, hold on. Which recognizes this region on both of these. Um, the splice variation is, the splice site is further down in this protein and they get the same, they see where clathrin is the most abundant, the APP is most abundant for both the 770 band, which is here, and then for a fainter, uh, I can't draw a fainter, but a fainter uh, 695 band. And then finally, they do one more Western blot for a protein called transferrin. And it has been shown in other work that the transferrin receptor is associated with clathrin-coated vesicles. And they get uh, the same type of banding pattern. That is the most transferrin where there is the most clathrin, so the highest concentration of clathrin-coated vesicles. And it follows the clathrin banding pattern and the APP banding pattern. Of course, the N-terminal antibody doesn't recognize this version of the protein because the N-terminal is missing. So we have our clathrin coated vesicles purified and they contain clathrin all the way around their surface. They have some sort of transferrin receptor, and they have three different versions of the amyloid precursor protein. Two full-length, two different types of full-length APP, and then one piece of APP that's been processed. So they're showing that 
that APP is indeed part of this endosomal lysosomal system. Okay, in the second biochemical purification, they used something called gel filtration, which I said was a way of separating things based on their size. And they have these beads that are semi-porous, so they have holes in them, and small things get caught up in the holes. It's kind of like a maze, and they have to go through the maze and then come out the other side in order to make it down to the bottom of the tube. So it's a clever uh, technique, and I mentioned that bigger stuff tends to just go around, and medium-sized stuff goes into the beads and they get caught for a while, but the smallest stuff gets hung up the most. And when you collect tubes of the fractions, that is, that come out, the large stuff comes out first and then the smaller stuff uh, trails behind. But at any rate, using this technique, they then do another set of amido black and again, they find a very big peak for clathrin. This time it's sort of in the middle. And then when they do a Western blot for APP, they get that same sort of banding pattern. So once again, they show in this particular approach that APP is associated with clathrin coated vesicles. And finally, they provide a nice figure, which is an electron microscopy photograph of the clathrin coated vesicles, and they show this beautiful field of vesicles. And they look a little different than those that we saw in recent Heuser because the sample that, the photograph that Reese and Heuser took was a, was a fixed embedded section of the clathrin coated vesicle, so you could very clearly see the little T's. In this case, it doesn't look like that because it's the whole vesicle, not a, not a slice of the vesicle. But at any rate, they just show with the electron micrograph, with the photograph taken with the electron microscope, that indeed their purification uh, yields a really pure form of clathrin coated vesicles and of course the proteins that are associated with them and the main point is that APP shows up in the clathrin coated vesicles and the real question still remains uh, where the processing actually happens and that remains a big focus for research in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, guys, that's it for today. I hope you are safe and healthy, and I'll talk to you Friday.